Good morning. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Calvary, and it's an honor to be here this morning to open God's Word together. We're continuing in our series, Questions Jesus Asked, and I'll let you know where we are this morning. So we're going to be in Mark 9, verse 33 to 37, as you want to open up there. But this series, Questions Jesus Asked, is about questions which Jesus asks people as he interacts. And we notice how many great questions Jesus asks throughout the Gospels. And what's fascinating is that these questions draw people out. They make things clear. They illuminate. And it's part of Jesus' way of interacting with people. He's constantly asking them questions. And our desire for this series is that we would allow these questions not just to be questions that were once asked to people, but questions that we allow to be asked of us, that we allow to examine us, that as we read God's word, which is living and active, that it would These questions would examine us. They would draw things out of us. They would expose and reveal things in our own hearts and lives so that we might learn more of what it is to walk with and follow Jesus. And so that's our hope for this series, Questions Jesus Asks, is to get insight into who Jesus is and what he wants for us as his people and to interact with him through these questions. Now, I want to start with a question before we look at Jesus' question, and it's this. What is true greatness? What is true greatness? Sometimes we ask the question, you know, who's the greatest of all time? After a Super Bowl, we'll often be these comparisons. Okay, how does this quarterback stack up to the greatest of all time? We have so many different ways we can measure greatness. If you look in the world of uh, billionaires, you can say, well, who's the most successful entrepreneur? Who, who's the most successful billionaire? One of the pastors sent me an article about, you know, which billionaire has the best spaceship? There's these ways of measuring greatness. One billionaire, you know, they, they, they're going to have a longer flight, but this one's going to go higher. This one has more windows in their spaceship, but there's bigger windows in this spaceship. It's like all these ways that we can compare greatness, these official metrics. It could be how many followers does someone have on social media. But my guess is that as we are here this morning, very few of us are probably wondering, you know, am I the greatest of all time as I stack up towards others? But a question I think we do ask often is, am I better than the person next to me? Where do I stack up? It's very easy that we live this life of comparison and wondering where we stand. Where do I stand in my family? Where do I stand in my career? My classmates who graduated, am am I on par? Am I above? Am I behind? There's so many ways that we can measure greatness. There's a book called I'm the Biggest Thing in the Ocean by Kevin Cherry, and it's a children's book about a giant squid. And the giant squid is going around, and as he's going around in the ocean, he keeps comparing himself to all these other creatures. And he sees, you know, a jellyfish and says, I'm bigger than that jellyfish. He sees a c- crabs, you know, I'm bigger than these crabs. And all these creatures he's comparing himself to, I'm bigger than this fish, that fish. And he's far off from a shark, and he says, I'm bigger than that shark. You know, he's scared to go near the shark, but he's saying, I'm, I'm bigger than him. And then the giant squid, or yeah, giant squid, he gets swallowed by a whale. And he's in the belly of the whale. And at first he's frazzled. Then he looks around and he says, I'm the biggest thing in this whale. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea I think that we can relate with that is we can live our lives constantly comparing. Where do I stand? Where do I stack up? How am I doing? Am I prettier? Am I smarter? Am I funnier? Is my career successful? Is my family put together? Are my kids better behaved? We're going to ask all these questions. Think about if you're a student, it's probably easily within, you get into a sport, and what are you wondering right away? Where am I on the team? We're all, it's so easy to constantly live this life of comparison, wondering where we stack up. And in our passage today, what's interesting is Jesus is going to enter into a question of greatness with his disciples. He's going to enter into their discussion. and He's going to ask a question to draw them out or to expose what they're talking about and a different way of seeing greatness. So Mark 9, verse 33 to 37 is where we're going to be. It says this, And they came to Capernaum, and he was in the house And when he was in that house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now, 
This is in a section of Mark where Jesus is journeying to the cross. He's on the way to the cross. So there's this journey to Jerusalem where he's gonna be crucified and rise three days later. And here he's been journeying with his disciples and they're now in Capernaum. And they're in a house, it says the house, and this is likely Simon Peter's house, one of his disciples. And so they're in the house of one of the disciples most likely and, and they're discussing and Jesus says, hey, as you were walking on the way, what was your discussion about? But notice what is their response? They're silent. We've made the point that often questions can draw you out. Maybe someone says, hey, tell me what, what was it like to grow up in a big city or in a small family, big family, only child? Tell, tell me what life was like for you growing up. That might open up a conversation. You sit down, you have a cup of coffee, you share about your life. But sometimes questions don't open up things. Sometimes the response of a question is silence. And that's what happens here. Jesus says, what were you discussing? And even his disciples know, we were not having the conversation we should have been having. <laughs> Something was off about this conversation and they're embarrassed to admit to Jesus, well, we were discussing who's the greatest. You could almost think about it like Adam and Eve in the garden. This is the moment when they've sinned, they've eaten the fruit they were told not to eat. And now they're in hiding and, and God says, where are you? That he knows where they are, but he's intentionally, purposefully going to draw them out. And this question is asked to them so that their hearts would be made clear, that they would reflect on what they've been discussing. And yet they're embarrassed. They've been walking with Jesus, but they know that even though Jesus is the Messiah, Peter has confessed that, he, that Jesus is the great Messiah, they know that there's something off about the conversation they were having. Now, before we put the disciples down as just silly and unrelatable, I think it's important to ask the question, you know, what if Jesus were to prompt us with this question? His disciples are following and walking with him. If Jesus were to ask us, hey, as you've been walking with me, as you've been following me, what have you been focusing on? What have you been discussing? Where's your heart been? Where have your energies been? Are you, are you trying to promote yourself, to compare yourself to others and seek your greatness? Or are you trying to serve and live in my example? You know, maybe we don't argue explicitly about who's the greatest, but isn't it true that we often so, that we so often signal our greatness to each other? That by the things we say or don't say, we try and put up an image of greatness that we compare ourselves as we go throughout our lives and we use even our proximity to Jesus as a way of self-promotion. The disciples here had recognized that something was special about Jesus. Peter's already said that you are the Messiah. So here's the Messiah who's going to bring in the kingdom of God and they're walking with him, they're the inner circle. And they wonder now, where do I stand as one who's close to Christ? They use their proximity to Jesus and they allow this world of self-promotion to enter in. And as those who are close to Jesus, they begin to lobby for their status. There's an author, Pete Scazzaro, who writes some of the books like Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. And he was making a point in a podcast that we live in a culture of self-promotion, where we, don't, we, don't want, we want to be clear. It's not wrong to say, hey, here's the gifts, here's the talents that I have. To be honest about that, if you're applying for a job, put down your experience and be open and honest about what you can and can't do. But he says, we live in a culture of self-promotion where we often feel like it's necessary for our survival to self-promote, to put forward this image. You can think about it, it's like you have to have your own brand. You have to have your own image, your own reputation that you're constantly trying to maintain. You need to be your own best hype man if you're gonna survive in our culture. This is often the way that we think about life, that we put forward the best image and we're trying to compete with others to show that we're the most qualified, to show that we're the best, show that we're the smartest, that we're the most worthy. It's so easy to live in this culture of self-promotion where we're constantly stacking ourselves up against others and wondering where we land. And it's easy to do this actually in the church, to just take this very way, the very same way of self-promotion and put it in the church. And I think that's actually what we see the disciples doing. They know what worldly greatness looks like. It's you put yourself above others and you show your greatness. And they're transferring this into the kingdom now. They're walking with Jesus and they're even using their proximity to Jesus as a way of self-promotion. 
They're missing the point that being with Christ isn't about elevating ourselves, but it's actually about serving as he does. And so we can do this in the church where we try and show why we're greater than others. We can use our closeness to Jesus. Maybe it's the things that we learned as we've read our Bibles and prayed with Jesus. Where all of a sudden, rather than that being something that we use to serve others, we say, do you see how smart I am? Do you see how insightful I am? Do you see the ways that I'm serving? Do you see the things that I'm doing for Jesus? We can look at other groups of Christians and we, some Christians could say this, we say, hey, you know, we're the Christians who really study and read and teach the Bible. So some Christians will pride themselves in one area and other Christians might say, you know, hey, we're the Christians who have the tradition. Look at our history and our tradition, the richness of this. Other, other Christians don't have this. We compare ourselves. Other Christians might say, hey, we're, we're those who know the Holy Spirit. We have giftings and we, we're, we're charismatic. We're, we're excited about what God's doing. We're, we worship exuberantly. We have the spirit. Other Christians might say, hey, we, we serve our community well. Now, all those things are great. Let's, let's be zealous in our praise of God. Let's be faithful in our scripture. Let's look to the tradition and history. Let's serve and re reach out to our community. But the point is, it's so easy that we begin to take the things that we do well and we begin to put down others. We try and lobby for our position, whether that's as a group or individuals. And so maybe we walk into the church and there's certain things that we're insecure about in our own lives. And so we begin to compare. Maybe you're someone who's really practically able to serve well. And so you use your serving and that's a good thing, but maybe there's other areas where you're insecure about. You're insecure about your understanding of certain things. You say, well, well I'm the one who really serves well. Or maybe you're someone who's insightful and intelligent, but you lack compassion at times. And you say, well, everyone else is just naive. This is my strength. Maybe you're someone, you look at someone else and you say, well, yeah, they, she looks pretty. She looks like her family's all put together, but I'm sure she's super judgmental. You know, whatever it is, like we just begin to have these ways in which we compare ourselves to others. We take our strengths maybe even good giftings that the Lord's given us. Insight, wisdom, care for others, an ability to reach people with the gospel, but we begin to compare it against other Christians. And we say, I'm actually greater, I'm better. And what Jesus is getting at here is a question of what, what have we been discussing? Even how have we let the ways of the world enter into the church as we stack ourselves against one another, as we compete with one another for status? And so Jesus begins this with a question, you know, what were you discussing on the way? He's wanting to know what their discussion was about. And then he's going to do something. He's going to redefine for them what greatness is. He's going to redefine for us what greatness is. So verse 35 says this, and he sat down and he called and called the 12. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Now notice here, Christ doesn't put down as a whole the idea of seeking greatness. He says, hey, you're talking about greatness. If you want to be first, this is what you should do. He says, you should be last of all and servant of all. So he doesn't put down the idea of greatness as a whole, but he's going to radically redefine how we see greatness. And he's going to redefine the way in which we reach greatness and our destination, our goal of what true greatness should actually look like. And so you could think about it like this. The disciples are not only going in the wrong direction, seeking the wrong way of greatness, they have the wrong destination. It's like you're trying to get to the beach and you're driving north to Canada. Maybe there's some good beaches up there, I, I don't know of any, but it would be much better if you were to fly to Hawaii. It's like where, if you're trying to get to the wrong destination the wrong way, that's what's happening here. Jesus saying, hey, your way of seeking greatness, you've missed it. And your goal of what greatness looks like, you've missed it. And so what's the way of greatness that Jesus is gonna show us here? Well, we see it in the life of Jesus. He says, if you would be first, be last and servant of all. This is the way of greatness. And we talked about how Jesus is on the way to the cross. So he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be handed over, crucified and killed. But his life is one in which he comes not to be served, but to serve. And he comes to be humiliated and actually put down. And his path to greatness is one of utter humiliation on the cross. And this section of Mark is him on his journey to Jerusalem. And actually what's fascinating is right before this, right before the dispute in Mark 9, 33, we see that Jesus tells his disciples that this is what he's about to do. 
So read with me Mark 9, verses 30 to 32. It says this, they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Now consider this for a moment. Jesus has just told, and Mark puts these back to back. Jesus has just told his disciples, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be handed over. And in three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. And Mark says, okay, now, now look at the conversation they're having. And what conversation are they having in verse 33? They're wondering about who's the greatest. And it says in verse 32, right before that, that they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And it's made very clear that they didn't understand because their conversation now is who is the greatest? It's like they're missing the point of Jesus' life and ministry, that it's not about self-promotion. It's not about becoming great in the eyes of man, but it's, it's about serving and going low. As Jesus goes low, he becomes servant. He becomes last of all. He comes to serve and to bring up those who are low. So they miss the way of greatness. And they also miss the goal of greatness. Because greatness is not about being great in one another's eyes, comparing ourselves to one another. But ultimately, greatness is about seeking the glory of our Father in heaven. It is what Jesus shows so clearly in his life. He was not great in the eyes of man. He was humiliated. He was rejected. He was hated. And yet, what we see in Christ is true greatness and where he is elevated to the right hand of his Father because of his suffering and death, because of his life in which he lives as last and least of all, he shows us what true greatness is, and it's not to seek the approval of man. And this is important because if we were just to redefine the way we seek greatness, we say, okay, well, in the church, greatness isn't about being uh, first, it's about being last. Then we could just say, hey, do you see that I'm last in line? Do you see the way that I'm serving? Do you see the ways that I'm seeking the needs of others? And we just turn it into a game where it's still all about, do you see me? Do you see me? Do you see me? Do you see what I'm doing? But Jesus is saying, no, no, that's not what true greatness is like. It's to be a servant and last of all. And the example of Jesus' life makes clear that the glory we seek is not the glory of people, the praise and the recognition and the status from people, but is actually the status from our Father in heaven. And so Jesus redefines for us what greatness is. It's to be last and to be servant. And so we want to ask the question of ourselves, as we sit under Jesus' teaching, are we allowing the cross in the example of Christ to reshape our vision of greatness? Are we, are we getting caught in the vision of greatness that our world has, of self-promotion, of comparison, or are we willing to step into the being servant and last of all? And so a few just diagnosis questions that we can consider is one would be this, do I only serve people who seem worthy of my service or can repay me? Do I only serve people who I think, man, they're really worthy of my service. They're really gonna recognize how important what I'm doing is for them. And they're gonna thank me and return it in gratitude or, or some ways that they will repay me and show me that they're worth my service. Another question we could ask is, do I avoid certain people or relationships? Because I think some people just aren't worth my time. I'm not talking about people who maybe have uh, done some harm and there's intentional reasons to stay away, but do, do we see, use some people in our family, in our community, our neighborhood, and our work is just, just not worthy of our time and energy? Do I get upset when people's needs disrupt my priorities? The life that Jesus is showing us here where we become servant and last of all is, is actually highly disruptive to our culture that idolizes productivity and efficiency. It's one in which we have, have to actually sacrifice our time, our plans often to serve others and to go low rather than merely seeking our own goals that seem like they would advance our plans. Am I willing to be treated as last? I see, Jesus, Jesus is trying to redefine for what, us what greatness looks like. It's not to put ourselves above, but it's actually to serve and go low so that others might be brought up 
And this is the example that we see so clearly in the cross. The cross is the paradigm. It's the picture, it's the image of how we know what true service looks like. And after he redefines this for us, he's gonna give us an image of what this looks like lived out. In verses 36 to 37, Jesus illustrates for us what it looks like to receive, to love and to care for the last and the least, to be a servant of all. Verse 36 says this, and he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. So Jesus takes this child, he receives him to his arms. And we don't know whose child this is, perhaps and likely I'd think one of the disciples But he receives this child and says, hey, do you want to know what it looks like to really seek greatness in the kingdom? Receive this child in my name. When you do that, you you are receiving me and you're receiving ultimately my father. So we want to ask the question, why children? Why is this the illustration that Jesus gives? I think the reason for children is because children are an example of what it means to be often last or considered least in the eyes of our world. We have statements like, oh, she's just a kid, or he's just a kid. We can often think very low of kids. Say, oh, what what do they know? They're they're just a kid. But what Jesus is showing us here is an image of him showing care and kindness for those who are vulnerable, for those who are dependent, who maybe will give nothing in return. What Jesus is doing is he's showing the incredible dignity and value, actually, of children here. These image bearers of God have value, and it's a value that could so easily be overlooked in a world that prizes and idolizes status and reputation. But Jesus is showing them as the disciples, this is who you are to receive. If you think about the disciples, what might they have valued? Maybe they want people with status and clout to join them, but would a child seem worth their time? Jesus is saying, absolutely that these children are valuable in my kingdom. And he goes on and he, he makes clear that even to receive a child is actually, in, as if it's done to him, is to receive him. You see, a parent is valued when someone shows kindness to their children. If a child's struggling to read, it means a lot if someone comes alongside that child and helps them learn to read. If you wanna honor parents, you show kindness to their children. And what Jesus is saying is this, look, do you see the value that every person has, as an image bearer of God, as one who is valuable and precious to me. When you care for those, not for your own advantage, not for your own gain, not for your own self-promotion, but when you care for them for their own sake, ultimately actually for Christ's sake, he says, I receive this as an act that is done unto me. And so he gives children as an example of those who are dependent, those who are often vulnerable and who may not give something in return but it's done out of love for Christ. So a question that we want to ask is how do we live out care for the vulnerable? How do we live out care for the vulnerable? There's a few questions that could maybe help us figure this out. One is where has the Lord placed you? So where has he already placed you in your life? What relationships? I mean, if you're a stay-at-home parent, you probably know a vulnerable or multiple vulnerable children already who you care for. You know their needs. You know that there may be times where, or it may be often that you aren't receiving thanks, but Jesus is actually giving incredible dignity to that work. You're caring for children as him. If you're a nurse or a teacher, nurse, you're probably interacting with vulnerable people all the time. If you're a teacher, you know the vulnerable people in your classroom. If you're serving in public service in some way, then you're constantly, I'm sure, interacting with people in areas of vulnerability. If you're in a job with other people, you probably know, whether you're a business owner or just somewhere in the organization, you know the vulnerable people in your organization. Maybe it's aging parents. You think about, okay, what what is it like to care for my aging parents and their vulnerability? And pray the Lord gives you wisdom as you figure out how to do that and to manage the responsibilities he's given you. Perhaps to, to work through relationship with your spouse in the middle of that. There's challenges to those situations. Maybe, maybe it's the, 
sickness or challenges that your spouse is going through, physical, mental, emotional, and that's the place where the Lord has placed you in the life of someone who's vulnerable to care for them. Maybe it's a neighbor. So the question of where has the Lord placed you? What relationships has he put in your life? Maybe it's just your younger sibling. And, and your kid has a younger sibling and you know what it's like to have to look out for their needs. Another question you could ask is where could you reach out or where may you reach out? You know, we're, you, you could think about different areas like refugee ministry, I think is a great example, where people are coming in from other countries and different culture, different language, and a number of people at this church I know have committed to helping on a team to help refugees as they're settling in the U.S. That's an example of caring for those who are in a place of vulnerability, independence. Think about issues of poverty, either here or overseas. Some of you, it may be on your heart to care for people in poverty, physical or spiritual poverty. For some people, it's a heart for issues like sex trafficking and helping to deal with that injustice. Maybe it's caring for the unborn and their vulnerability. There's all sorts of different causes that the Lord may call us to, and he's probably not gonna call all of us to all of these, he won't, but there may be a question of, is there something that the Lord's placed on your heart as a burden to be involved in? For some of us, the question of, okay, where has the Lord placed me? And then are, are there places where the Lord would have me to reach out through a calling on my life in some area? or to take an opportunity. And then finally, you could ask, where's the Lord worked grace in your life? I think the truth is that some of the greatest tragedies and weaknesses in our life are the places where God's gonna use to minister to other people in vulnerability. So where have you been vulnerable? Like where have you had tremendous need that God has met in his grace? Maybe he's brought people alongside you in some challenge in your life. Well, that may actually be one of the most profound ways in which you can now serve, that God has shown comfort in your life and weakness. He came to you when you were vulnerable, and that then becomes a place in which you can minister. Maybe that's through some, some level of addiction, alcohol, substance, or whatever it may be, that you've experienced this trouble. And now as you think about that, that's not merely some blip in your past, but it's actually an area which God's grace can flow over into and through you. Maybe it's been through grief, loss of a child, loss of a spouse, miscarriage, pain and, su and suffering that the Lord is actually able to use now as he's ministered grace in your life to use that weakness, that pain, that sorrow as a place of strength in ministering. Maybe it's a physical or mental condition. Whatever weakness it might be, there's experiences where we have suffered and been in need where God and his, has come to us as those who are vulnerable. And that's what we see in this passage. We see Christ, and he's embracing the child. And I really think it is helpful for us to consider that this is an image of how Jesus actually embraces us in our vulnerability and weakness. How does he care for us? Well, he comes to us when we have nothing to offer him. He comes to us when we're dependent. And yet, what does he do? He receives us. He comes as the servant and last of all, so that we might be brought into his family and his kingdom. And I think the reason why we actually don't need to compare ourselves going back is because if we actually see ourselves secure in the embrace of Christ, then those games just become ridiculous. It's like the love of God is shown to us in our weakness when we have nothing to offer. Not when we made a brand for ourselves, not when we promoted ourselves, not when we showed ourselves worthy of God's love, but he comes to us at our worst. Romans 5, 8 says that God shows his love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. He comes to us in our worst moments of vulnerability. And now his commission as those who have been received by him, that, that we have this opportunity, this call in our lives to, to step out and to embrace others as he's embraced us. In Matthew 25, it's a passage that has some really good parallels to this passage, but it's the final judgment, and Jesus is talking to the righteous and the first part. And he says this. He, he tells them, hey, you, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And they say, when did this happen? And Matthew 25, 37 to 40 says this. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? <laughs> 
And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And then the king, and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. What Jesus is saying here is what you do for others in service to him is, is actually ultimately done unto him. And I think if we could think about what would a valuable thing for us to do, be for us to do as Christians, I think we would all agree there'd be tremendous value in showing honor and dignity and care to Christ in the flesh. Think about in his life and his ministry, he's crucified and those who care for his body after he's crucified, this precious dignity and value in that moment. And what Jesus is saying here is what you do for the least, what you do for the least of these, when you receive them in my name, it's as though you're doing it to me. And Christ puts this call on our lives that as we go throughout our lives, as we go throughout our weeks this week, whatever places you're gonna be, with the people you encounter, he's saying there's actually an opportunity to care for me as you care for those people. That as I have embraced you, as I have received you, I send you out so that you would be a light to this world, that you would make known the receiving love of my father and myself. And it's a high calling, but it's a tremendous blessing that we have a God who seeks us when we're lost and he calls us to care for those who he's put in our path. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you seek us at our worst. I thank you that when we were naked and clothed in shame, exposed and weak, starving and destitute and without hope, that you came to us. And Lord, I pray that your grace would overflow through our lives. I pray for the men and women and children here as we go out into our weeks. Think of just the numerous myriads of people with whom they will interact. And I pray that we would have eyes to see the vulnerable who are around us. I pray that we would have hearts to love as you have loved us and that we would have wisdom and discernment and a, a willingness to take steps of courage to love and care for those around us. I pray that as your church, that we would live in such a way that would be a witness to the love of Christ, to the gospel, and the ways in which we have been received by you. Lord, we pray for your strength, we pray for your wisdom, we pray for your joy, and we pray for your peace in all that we do. Help us live this out faithfully and sit under your teaching. In Jesus' name, amen.